Hi everyone, I'm Susan Mulvihill and no, I am not out in my garden today because it's still covered with snow. Fortunately, what I wanted to discuss with you can be done indoors where it's nice and warm. For my March 4th column, I wrote about preparing to garden and I discussed a lot of important concepts in it, which I want to expand upon today in this video. Now you can always find a link to my garden columns on my website, susansinthegarden.com. So let's get right to it. Whether you're growing vegetables or ornamental plants, it's so important that you know what your hardiness zone is. And it's very easy to find out. All you do is a web search using the words USDA hardiness zones, and you should go right to the website. But I'll also include the web address within this video. Now, once you get to the website, you just put in your zip code and it will tell you what your hardiness zone is and your average minimum temperatures during the winter months. And so that should be very helpful. Now, let me show you one reason why this is really important information. Once you know your hardiness zone, you should be able to find out how many frost-free days you have in a season. This is from the last expected frost in the spring to the first expected frost in the fall. Obviously, this will vary slightly, but it will give you a rough idea. I live in Spokane, Washington, and we typically have about 120 frost-free days in a season. That's a fairly short growing season, especially for things that take a long time to mature. I'm talking about tomatoes, melons, pumpkins, and winter squash, for example. Now, in looking at the typical seed packet for vegetables, you will see something like days to maturity or days to harvest. This refers to how long it takes a plant to produce mature fruit. The days to maturity information is really most applicable to the region where the plants that they harvested the seeds from were grown, but it does give us a rough guideline. So if you live in an area with a short growing season, it's best to err on the side of caution by selecting short season varieties. But what's really important for you to understand is that the days to maturity information refers to the date you transplanted your seedlings out in the garden and not when you first started your seeds indoors. When I talked about vertical gardening in my column, I mentioned vining summer squash. You are probably thinking, vining? There's no such thing. Well, for the past few years, I've been growing what is called trombone zucchini and wanted to recommend it to you. This is a zucchini that is vining rather than a bush form like we're all familiar with. You grow them on some type of a support and they are absolutely delicious. Not to mention a great conversation starter. The variety I grow is called Trombetta di Albenga, and I got the seeds from Renee's Garden Seeds. There's a similar variety called Zucchetta Tromboncino. Try it, you'll love it. One of the things I mentioned in my column was floating row cover, and so I wanted to clarify that a bit more. So this is what it looks like. It's pretty thin. And if you're somebody who sews, you might know what interfacing looks like, and this looks very similar to it. So it's this woven fabric, it's very lightweight. It lets sun and air through it, but it also lets moisture through it. So if it were to rain, it would come through here and still water your plants. Now, I like floating roll cover for a few reasons. For one thing, if I put it on hoops, and over a planting in my garden in the spring, it gives them a few degrees of frost protection, which is awesome. And also you can use it in the fall to extend the season a little bit in the same manner. Another thing that I like about it, and this is huge, is if there are some plants I'm growing that are susceptible to certain types of bothersome insects, things like aphids, cabbage worms, leaf miners, and so on, then I love to cover my plantings with this for the entire season. Now this only applies to plants that do not need to be pollinated because obviously if this is covering over some plants, the bees can't get to them to pollinate the flowers. However, I do like to start some heat loving crops in the spring 
and cover them for two or three weeks with the floating row cover because again it makes it just a little bit warmer underneath and that gets the plants off to a great start. Now you can find floating row cover at large well-stocked nurseries. If you're in Spokane, Northwest Seed and Pet has this huge roll of it that is five feet wide and you just buy it by the linear foot so you just pay for what you need or you can find it online. You just do a web search on floating row cover and you'll find all kinds of sources. The last thing I wanted to talk with you about is crop rotation. That's something that I mentioned in my column and I wanted to take a bit of the mystery out of it. Now I know a lot of people will say, I'm a home gardener, I don't need to do crop rotation. That's something that farmers do. Well, I understand what they're saying, but I have to tell you that crop rotation is a simple, free, easy tool and you can use it to thwart insect and disease problems in your garden and I think that's a big deal. Now every year I have a healthy, productive garden, a minimal amount of insect problems, pretty much no disease problems and I attribute that to the fact that I rotate my crops every year. Put simply, crop rotation is moving around families of vegetable crops in your garden year after year and that's so those insects can't find the same family of plants each year and also disease pathogens will be in the soil and they are specific to different types of families of vegetable crops. And so if you move things around, you can minimize that kind of a problem as well. So let me show you how I rotate my crops and hopefully that'll make it real simple. The first thing you need to know is your plant families. And don't worry, you don't have to know them by heart. All you need to do is to go to my website, susansinthegarden.com, and go to the guides menu. Now alphabetically listed under there is a link that says vegetable plant families. And so you'll notice I've got the beet family, brassicas or coal crops, carrot family, cucurbits, which would be things like cucumbers, melons, squash, and so on. Grass, that would be corn. Your legumes, the nightshade family, that's really important to know. Eggplants, peppers, potatoes, tomatillos, and tomatoes. The onion family, and yes, the sunflower family, because that includes artichokes and lettuce, believe it or not. So start with that. Some years ago, I created a template on my computer that is my garden layout, and it has all of the raised beds on it. What I've been doing for the, quite a few years now is writing down where I'm growing different crops, and then I hang on to those forms. So here is my 2016 garden layout and you can see where I grew the different crops. You'll also notice some red stars, which is very important. Now you'll recall I mentioned that the tomato family members are tomatoes, potatoes, eggplants, peppers, and tomatillos. That family of crops is the most susceptible to disease problems. It can also get Colorado potato beetles and tomato hornworms but the diseases are more what I'm trying to keep away from. So here I'm going to show you my layout from last year. And again, I've put a little asterisk next to the tomato family crops. So when I sat down and wanted to figure out where I want to plant things this year, I took into account where I planted any tomato family plant during the past couple of years. I actually like to do three years, but two years would be acceptable. And so that told me, do not plant any tomato crops in any of these beds that have a red star on them. So for this year, when I created my form, the first thing I looked for was where can I plant my tomato family crops. So you'll notice that I have put the potatoes and the peppers in different spots. You can't really see at the bottom here, but 
There are some other beds in an adjoining area and I'm always rotating them. Now the nice thing about those beds is that the corn bed, the tomato and squash beds, I just keep rotating them every single year and each of them is from a completely different family of crops so that works out really well. So what I recommend to you is to create some kind of a layout, keep them for a few years, and each time you're planning a new garden, you want to look through and say, okay, where did the tomato family crops go? Let me put them in different beds this year. And then I'll look at maybe the cucurbit family, which again is things like melon, squash, cucumbers, and so on. And I'll see, okay, where did I plant those last year? and then I'll find new beds for them. It gets a little complicated, but it is something that is worth my time. One other thing I wanted to mention about rotating your crops is that if you have a small garden, that can be very challenging to do, and I get that. But there is something important that you need to do no matter what. That is always rotate your tomato family crops. That is the most important family of plants to move around in your garden. And that might mean maybe you're going to plant tomatoes in pots one year or two years, and then the next year plant your tomatoes back in the garden. So that's an option. Another thing is if you happen to be purchasing seedlings from a nursery or purchasing tomato seeds, look on the packet or the plant tag and see what kind of disease resistance they have. So try to err on the side of purchasing seedlings that have more disease resistance. So that's an option for you. And then one last thing I wanted to mention, you know, I love having these little layouts and you know, they will fit into a gallon size Ziploc bag. And so I can take these out to the garden when I'm starting to plant because I'm never going to remember where everything goes. And so I put them in here, zip them shut, and then they stay clean and work for all season long. So I hope this video has been helpful. I will see you next week. Mm -hmm.